Welcome to Wireless Future. Um, I'm Eric Larsson and I'm here as always with my colleague Emil Björnsson. Hello Emil, how are you today? I'm great, so it's nice to be back with another episode. As always. Um, so the idea for today is to do a Q&A on Massive MIMO. And we have a bunch of questions here that we harvested from the YouTube uh, comments, from the blog, and also from emails that we've been receiving. Uh, so I think without further ado, we'll get this started. So Emil, the first question is on the 5G standard and why Massive MIMO has not been fully adopted by the standard. And specifically, I mean, the question is, is it true that some companies have started to implement Massive MIMO on their own independently of the standard? That's what the question states, I mean. So could you elaborate on this? So I think the first question is really, what is Massive MIMO that has or has not been implemented? And that is sort of the key issue here that is there a universally accepted definition of what really Massive MIMO means? I think you and me might be purists saying that uh, this must be implemented in a TDD mode, reciprocity based beam forming and all of those type of things. And our books are sort of saying something about how you should implement it. But when you are then taking that to develop a standard based on it. It's uh, hard to say exactly what is Massive MIMO, what is not, and uh, uh, where do we draw the line? Yeah, uh, of course. But I mean, so but it, would you say it's true, as the comments suggested here, that some companies are implementing Massive MIMO on their own independently of the standard? I thought that you, at the minimum, I mean, if you implement a, a wireless technology, it has to be compatible with others so that the terminals can talk with a base station or um yeah i'm not sure i'm re reading the question well here i mean but no i, I think it, it uh, that is definitely true uh, but the the thing is that i don't think it's independently developed but i think that the the thing to understand is that the wireless standard is like a skeleton that puts the basic foundation of what you need to do uh, in order for the mm -hmm. system to work. So what should the base station mm -hmm. send to the user? What should the user send back? And have a list of different options that could be utilized there. And then you mm -hmm. purposely are not uh, implementing, or sorry, you're not standardizing every single detail, both because you should be able to make it future-proof so you can improve the implementation mm -hmm. in the future and to give the different vendors possibilities of implementing their own features and making it as good as possible on top of the skeleton that is already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, especially receiver algorithms, for example, aren't specified in the standard, right? So you could do anything you want there. And uh, while the sort of, I mean, if we think TDD massive MIMO, then the canonical algorithms are maximum ratio and zero forcing and all that. But in principle, nothing prevents a vendor from implementing something more advanced. And I suppose the same goes for channel estimation. You could exploit all sorts of prior information to improve on the estimates. Um, so that's not specified in the standards. So there might also be um, perhaps part of the answer here. Yeah, so, so what you standardize is really, okay, uh, you are going to send certain signals that allow you to estimate the channels and then what kind of estimate you implement, that's up to you. And then you know that you're going to beamform things in the downlink in, and what kind of scheme you utilize to select the beams, that's mm. also up to you. Mm. Uh, as long as there is a mechanism for the users to sort of figuring out how you were transmitting. And that's why mm. even if we are always saying that you only need to send pilots in one direction, you might do it in both directions just because you, you might not be aware of what kind of algorithms that are utilized in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So I suppose the main uh, items that the standards specify are the format of the reference signals, right? The, I mean, the pilots and also the for, for FTD versions of Massive MIMO, I suppose the code books are specified. Um, but apart from that, you can pretty much implement whatever you, you, you like and that you think works best. Yeah, sure. So, so when it comes to these reference signals, they have two options. There is what they call the CSIRS or channel state information reference signals that are what the base station can send according to a codebook and the downlink. And then you can feed back information based on that. And the other option is what is called sounding reference signals or SRS that you send in the uplink and that is sort of this type of uplink pilots that we are suggesting to utilize and when you implement mm -hmm. things you can choose which of these options you should support. Mm. 
Yeah, great. All right. Uh, you want to go on to the second question? Yes. So the second question, and all the questions today will be on the theme of Massive MIMO. Uh, how are the antennas calibrated in Massive MIMO? Yeah, so I'll see if I can have a go on that one. Um, that's a good question, and I believe it's a question that still to this day is a source of misconceptions. Because speaking of calibration of an antenna array, there are really two sorts of calibration that could potentially be relevant. Number one is phase calibration from one element relative to the next. And that would be necessary if the array is used to estimate directions of arrival um, or to use to beam form into specific directions of departure. Um, I mean, to, to perform such beam forming, you would need to know precisely what does phase zero mean at each one of the elements, because the whole idea of directional beam forming is that you phase shift the signal and have complete control over the relative phase between neighboring elements in the array. I mean, that's how beamforming works when you shoot power into distinct direction, angular directions or spatial directions. Now, TDD reciprocity-based massive MIMO that we uh, argue for and that we have in, in our textbooks, for example, does not require phase calibration in that sense at all. But then there is the second sort of calibration, and that is reciprocity calibration. Uh, which means that we know the relative phase between the receiver chain and the transmit chain at each one of the antennas. So no need for knowledge of anything relative between the antennas, but a need for knowing the relative phase, what it means for phase to be zero on uplink versus phase to be zero on downlink. And that reciprocity calibration is required for TDD, reciprocity-based massive MIMO, to work. And it can be accomplished through a variety of means. I mean, I'm, I know of experiments where they've used like mutual coupling within a large array between the elements to perform this calibration using very clever schemes and, and mathematics and regression fits and so forth. Um, it can also be accomplished by having specific transceivers dedicated to the calibration task. And I mean, there's a, there's a wealth of methods here, but that calibration is necessary. And I think it's worth reiterating this point that there are two sorts of calibration. And for TDD, massive MIMO, it's only the reciprocity calibration that's needed. Um, and again, when, in contrast, when you want to beamform into distinct angular directions in space, then it's rather the relative phase calibration that would be, would be required. Yeah, when it comes to that, I was in conversation with some hardware people the other week, uh, which was really about people who are used to working with what we call phased arrays, where you have this type of phased uh, phase references that you know, and which are typically utilized just to beamform in different angular directions. And they were like saying that, look, if we're going to illuminate different parts of the countryside, then we need this type of information. And so complicated in what you're suggesting with Massive MIMO, where we in every millisecond we need to send the pilot so we can learn the channels and uh, for a brief moment of time face align the signals to certain points. Mm. Uh, and in a way that is a valid argument but on the other hand we have built wireless standards for decades now where we are sending pilots every millisecond so it is not a mm. practical problem. No. No, no. I mean, it's been demonstrated all over again, right, that reciprocity-based massive MIMO beamforming works with pilots in every coherence block. Um, so, again, but there, there seems to be, I mean, a tendency, even to this day, to conflate these two different types of calibration, where for the TDD reciprocity MIMO, only the second one actually has any importance. And then uh, when it comes to the uplink downlink uh, reciprocity there, uh, this has to do with the hardware components, right? That you use different pieces of hardware partially in the uplink and the downlink, and they are not uh, calibrated uh, with each other. Yeah, the, I mean, yes, I mean, there are different chains of electronics to start with, and they have their built in imperfections and they have te components as characteristics vary with temperature and perhaps age with time and so forth. But I mean, that said, this reciprocity calibration doesn't have to be performed very often. It's not like you have to do it every millisecond. You might have to do it a couple of times per minute or something like that. I mean, depending on the air quotes, like quality of the hardware components, then 
you have to do it less or more or less often but in terms of resources required it's negligible yeah and uh, then I, I believe for the base station it shouldn't be a big issue because it's turned on continuously and you can use this additional information now and then to uh, to calibrate it but if you are turning on and off your phone or it, it sort of goes down to sleep mode and then you uh, yeah. open it up again then I guess the, the phone might not be able to be uh, calibrated between uplink and downlink all the time. Is that right? That That's a good point. But the terminals don't need reciprocity calibration for re- reciprocity-based massive MIMO to work, at least not with, a sing- at least not with single antenna transmission uh, from the terminal. Um, uh, I guess you, you so might, yeah, might be less of an issue. Uh, yeah. You might have to send pilots in both directions then so that you can sort of rotate your uh, constellation diagram in the downlink as well so you get the right right mm. you you'll need refer- i mean if you if you are if the terminal isn't reciprocity calibrated then you'll need to have a reference signal on the downlink to rotate the signal constellation right although that could also be solved by other means i mean blind algorithms but yeah. i don't know might lead too far to go into here yeah. All right. Great. So I'll move on through the list. Um, the next question we received is on UAVs, so like flying vehicles and drones, and whether a massive MIMO can be deployed on a UAV, or can we use massive MIMO to serve UAVs? Yeah, this is an you, you uh, interesting <laughs> question. So, so I think UAVs are these uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, which we are normally calling drones, and. Uh, so both of these type of options are things that people are considering, at least both to serve UAVs or to put the base station on the UAV. And if you think about putting the base station on there, I think one of the the main issues with drones is that the time that you can fly around before you have to go down and recharge your batteries is relatively short because it's mm. sort of a heavy piece of thing to start with and then if you put additional equipment on it then it becomes even heavier so i was looking at this 64 antenna uh, 3 gigahertz band and uh, base station antennas that are used today they weigh 60 kilos for uh, and if you go up to the uh, millimeter wave band then i think that it 13 kilo the street macro base station that i mentioned in the last episode uh, so those pieces of hardware is not what you're going to put there and then i guess in addition to that uh, you will have a heavy uh, power consumption also for all the processing and uh, and transmit powers that said, I think that there are use cases for base stations put in a UAV. You sort of send them up, you are watching the world from another angle, and in that way you can provide better coverage in certain areas. And in particular, when you are in troubles uh, in the regions, you are looking for people in the countryside that have been stuck somewhere. I guess you can improve the coverage by sending a base station, but it should be the simplest type of base station that you can imagine. You don't want to use it for... So you're saying that um, massive MIMO base station, the way we think of it, at least for lower frequencies, just too clumsy to attach to a UAV because it's too heavy and you'll need really a big helicopter or something <laughs> to carry it. For the time being, uh, mm-hmm. uh, then you never know how much you can shrink these type of things in uh, in the future. And maybe if you can cut down on requirements on out-of-band emissions and things like that, you can simplify the hardware a lot and use like uh, uh, UE hardware instead, things from the handsets. Yeah, right. All right, well... Um... Then we have the other part of the question, right? Uh, oh, yeah. If we can serve them. And this is an interesting thing. I, I wrote a paper with some people at Nokia a few years ago where we were talking about that particular thing because I think the base station that are normally utilized, the, the ones that are not doing beam forming, they're just down tilted a little bit and then you transmit the beam mm-hmm. down to the earth. Then the problem is that if you have a UAV flying right above it, it will not be inside of the beam that you are focusing towards the Earth. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you just try to connect it to the mobile network, what will happen is that you probably will have a base station that is much further away, that happened to have its first side lobe 
pointing upwards that is covering you partially. And since it's line of sight, you're typically going to see the base station in these cases, then uh, you will still get reasonable uh, service, but you will sort of blast the entire Earth around you with a lot of signals because uh, you're connecting to something that is much further away, you increase your power, and you are creating a lot of interference to the ground. Mm. And I think here, yeah, that, the beam forming capability on Mass and Mime Array can be utilized to sort of uh, send beams up to the UAV just so that you can send it down to Earth. That's an interesting point. I mean, I always thought of like, for this use case, communicating with UAVs, then you'd have like a dedicated ground station with the antennas. Because, I mean, antennas pointing upwards towards the sky, right? I mean, antennas, I mean, they're like individual antennas in the array because these antennas are going to have some intrinsic gain and then you probably want that gain to have its main pointing beam direction upwards rather than downwards. Um, but obviously one could think of using like existing cellular infrastructure as well to communicate with the drones. Yeah, so I think that was a starting point point for this work that some operators were interested in knowing if we would uh, buy your new massive MIMO equipment can we use them to serve things flying around in the sky as well or mm. would we have to have mm. dedicated equipment and as you say it might yeah. be always be better if you can put something that is pointing yeah. upwards but it seems like this could work to a good extent mm -hmm. yeah all right good um, you want to move on yes. to the next uh, question on the list? So when reading about Massey MIMO, I come across a term called channel hardening. Could you explain what it means? Okay, so I'll do this one. So channel hardening, this is a basic uh, thing that's explained, I think, in, uh, in our books, among others. And so here's the main point that think of a terminal with a single antenna receiving something in the downlink. Now that terminal is going to see the data symbols through an effective scalar channel. And that scalar channel is going to be equal to the actual physical channel, which is m-dimensional. With an, If we have an array with m antennas, it's m-dimensional. So it's like a vector with m elements. Times an m-dimensional beamforming vector. So it's like an inner product or scalar product between two m-dimensional vectors, right? And that scalar product is the sum of m variables. And these variables are like fluctuating and random because of the fading. So think of it as like this effective scalar channel that the terminal sees the data through is a sum of m random variables. And then you can argue like with the law of large numbers or the central limit theorem that if m is large enough, then this number is going to stabilize statistically. So it'll be very close to its statistical average, to its expected values. It's fluctuate very little around its statistical average. That's what channel hardening means. And the, the implication is that the effective scalar channel that the terminal sees is rather independent of time and it's independent of frequency. So that with OFDM modulation, for example, and every subcarrier in the system gets to see the same effective gain more or less so this simplifies a lot of things i mean one thing is it simplifies resource allocation because there's not much point any longer to schedule users at different portions in the frequency domain or in the time domain for that matter and it also simplifies mechanisms like power control because the effective gain stabilizes and becomes equal to its statistical mean then there is no point in adapting the transmit power to individual fading realizations any longer um, so I think that's really what the question here. Yeah, the, the, there were a follow-up question agree. that was saying, uh, so do we need to update the power control in every coherence block since the channels are changing at that pace? Uh, or if not, how often do we have to update or run our power control algorithms? Yeah, so the power, I think that's largely a misconception. I mean, so because of the channel hardening, then the effective channel gain and for that matter, also like the effective gain of all the interference will be substantially independent of frequency and of time so that it's enough to perform power control, compute power control variables or coefficients only when the large scale fading changes. And now with a caveat that if there is scheduling in the system such that users come and go quickly, then that will affect the interference level and it will affect the, say, optimal power control as well. So I think the answer is really here, well, 
recompute the power control whenever the large scale fading changes, which is very slowly, um, and or whenever the scheduling assignments uh, change significantly. Yeah, so so it probably will be the the scheduling or a few high mobility users that will be, be changing these type of things. And mm. and then I I would guess that this also will be that uh, it's just going to be f some of these statistical parameters that is going to change at the time. So you can sort of start from your current solution and evolve it. It's not going to be totally random as it would be in mm. a scenario with uh, a lot of fading that is affecting your games mm. yeah probably right so uh, yeah yeah uh, and when it comes mm. to, to this uh, i think one misconception that i've sometimes come across is also that people are saying oh so due to channel hardening we don't need to estimate the channels uh, so often anymore but that's not right no, no. true <laughs> no no that's that that's that's really i think a misconception you want to explain what's going on here yes yeah, so, so it's sort of you in order to get that scalar channel that you mentioned, which was the inner product between the physical channel and some kind of vector representing your tra beamforming transmission, you need to... Uh, yes, so the channel is changing as quickly as it does in every wireless channel. And then you are reselecting your beamforming vector based on new estimates of the channels. And then when you form that inner product, then every time you have done that, you get approximately the same value, but you still need to learn the channel. Mm. Yeah, you still have to learn the channel for the purpose of beamforming in every coherence block, right? I mean, that's the whole point of the reciprocity-based beamforming. You actually do that. So in a way, you air quotes, like track the channel or re-estimate it on a time scale, which is the coherence time of the actual physical channel. But notwithstanding that, the effective scalar gain of the channel that the terminal sees in the beamforming is very stable and close to its statistical mean. All right, good. Um, yeah, I think we'll move on through the list. And here's the next question. So it is about EIRP, effective isotropic radiated power, and whether that is an issue when applying massive MIMO in practice. You want to answer that, Emil? Yes. So this is sort of a measure of, uh, say that uh, when you're transmitting, you always have a directivity of your signals. And if you are considering, okay, what is the direction where I'm putting the strongest amount of energy? Uh, and then you would consider a, a transmitter that was sending that information isotropically, so in all directions, how much power would that one consume? And uh, it, in reality, we are never consuming that power because we have the directivity, uh, but it matters in, in particular when we talk about out-of-band emissions. And that's something that we've been talking about as an important aspect earlier as well in the previous episode. Uh, so typically when you are buying a license to use a certain amount of spectrum, you have strict requirements of how much emissions you're allowed to put outside your band. And then the important thing is not how much power you're transmitting with, but what is the strongest power that you get in a particular direction. And that's what this is EIRP is specifying. Mm. And this can be very complicated to uh, actually measure. So if you just have one antenna, you might know from physics how it's going to behave. But then you put together a big array, and then you should put it into a uh, measurement room. Uh, and then you know that as large as the array is, the far field becomes further away. So you need to have a bigger room so you can actually measure what is the actual directivity that you are getting uh, which in practice and not only what the physics are, are telling us. Um, uh, but I, I was looking into this when it comes to, to the massive mind because it's really about that when you put more antennas together and you're transmitting, say, with the same total power, you get more directivity. Uh, so you get this type of, of issue that... Uh, if you want to keep the transmit power fixed and you increase the size of your array, well, then uh, you get more directivity. And if you have a uh, license that is saying that you have a certain maximum EIRP, then the more antennas you use, the more you need to cut down on your power to compensate. So that could mm. be a, a practical problem. And that opens the question, when they are selling now 5G licenses, what type of out-of-band requirements are they going to be? Uh, because you're really sort of 
designing this for the worst case. And if that never happens, well, uh, then should you care about these other banned emissions in the worst cases? Uh, I was looking mm. in Sweden, so we have a 5G uh, license uh, auction uh, that it will soon start. And, and there, when they're talking about the 2 and 3 gigahertz band, if you are putting up a uh, base station with a fixed uh, antenna, then they say that uh, you're allowed to have an EIRP of 68 dBm uh, per 5 MHz of, of spectrum. Or if you use a massive MIME array, uh, it's only 47 dBm per 5 MHz, uh, which means 50 Watt. But then they are not measuring the EIRP, but instead the total emitted power. And then uh, 68 and 47, well, there's a, uh, say, 21 dB difference between that one, which is sort of saying that, well, as long as your uh, array is, is not having more than a 20 dBi directivity, mm. it's more or less the, the same type of requirements. But if you are... So 20 dB uh, directivity is like 100 antennas, right? It, yes, if there would be omni antennas. Uh, I think it, yeah. uh, this type of Massimima rays where they have like 64 elements, 32 in each polarization and the polarization are behaving differently, they might have 24 dBi directivity mm. because they sort of are 32 in each polarization and 9 dBi intrinsic uh, uh, directivity of each other. Yeah, element. sure. I meant the gain from mm. having an array yeah. in itself is 20 dB if you have 100 antennas, roughly speaking. Yeah, so I, I think that what this really means is that in Sweden, the regulations are saying that you're allowed to have a little bit more directivity if you put up a massive MIME array as compared to what we are used to. Uh, but if we are uh, having uh, requirements in the country that are going to be the same, so you're not allowed to increase your directivity. Well, then that effectively means that you are, are forced to transmit with less power, which doesn't have to be a problem because uh, massive MIMER is really about pointing the energy where it should be. So uh, if it's the same requirements as you had in the center of your cell before, well, now you can deliver that towards the cell edge as well. Mm. well would this be an issue if we had larger arrays? I mean, there's 20 dB here. What if you have like a thousand antennas or, I mean, that'd be like 30 dB, right? Or 10,000 antennas. I don't know whether massive MIME with 10,000 antennas is practical or not in any sense or even useful, but just for the sake of argument, suppose it is, then that would be like a 40 dB increase in the, in, in the array gain. Mm. Uh, so would that be an issue then with these numbers that you suggested earlier? Yes, so if you have a, a requirement on your EIRP, uh, then it will be a problem that you will be forced to cut down on your power. If uh, uh, you have a license that is not specifying the EIRP or maybe a combination of them, uh, then uh, you might be allowed to still use the same power or not cut down proportionality to your additional array gain. But it, uh, it sort of shows that we shouldn't expect to use massive MIMO in every country to increase the signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, but it should be r roughly the same as it would have been if you have a fixed uh, beam in the right direction. Uh, it's rather about that you can multiplex multiple things at the same time and frequency. Mm. So, so the short answer here is that EIRP has to be considered as a factor in the game when yeah. deploying massive MIMO, especially, I mean, the larger array, the more of an issue it is, right? Yeah, so the, you you are essentially taking, to compute the ERP, you take your total power in dB, you, uh, you are adding the strongest directivity in dB, and uh, if you have a strict requirement, well, if you increase one, you have to cut down on the other. Yeah. All right. Good. Uh, shall we move on yes. on the list? We have a couple of more questions to go, I think. Yes. you want to do the next one? Uh, what is the future of wireless power transfer? Can the massive MIMA push its limits? Yeah. So let's see if I could give an attempt on that one. Um, so wireless power transfer is a highly exciting technology. I mean, as the name suggests, the idea is to transmit power wirelessly and now the difficulty with this in general is that we don't want high power transmitters and then 
be as human in the vicinity of them, right? I mean, you wouldn't want like a kilowatt of <laughs> transmitter and then stand a meter from it. It'd be like opening, I mean, running the microwave with the, with the door open. Um, so looking at like state of the art in wireless power transfer, there are transmitters that emit about a watt. And then within a meter or two from them, you can harvest like a milliwatt. And a milliwatt is enough to keep some electronics going, right? So now the question is whether a directive transmitter could significantly extend this range of a meter or two. And uh, it seems the answer is yes. I mean, it's always the difficulty with getting a MIMO transmitter to be effective is to get the array gain, which in turn requires channel state information at the transmitter. So, I mean, in in plain English, the MIMO transmitter would have to know in what direction to point the beam, right? So there would have to be some exchange of pilots or the this little device that we want to beam power to would have to transmit something like a small spark or a small <laughs> air quotes like pilot reference signal so that the MIMO array could determine where, where to point the beam and where to direct the power. But in principle, I mean, if you think of it with 100 antennas at the transmitter, you get an array gain of 20 dB and in free space line of sight, 20 dB is, uh, that's 100 times. So that's 10 times in range, right? In free space line of sight. So... Uh, and that's, again, in free space line of sight with a path loss exponent of 2, whereas if we are indoors, then the path loss exponent is probably smaller because there is rebouncing against the walls and, I mean, the energy doesn't disappear and doesn't radiate away omnidirectionally and just disappears in space. So <clears throat> the potential range extension might be even even, even uh, higher there. So I think the short answer is... Uh, is yes, massive MIMO can definitely push the limits of wireless power transfer. I think we'll be seeing this happening, and I'm especially optimistic of uh, distributed MIMO solutions like radio weaves and radio stripes and that type of, of technology where, I mean, the, the, the walls might be entirely covered by, by antennas that can operate coherently together and be informed and so forth. So I think it is an exciting direction where we are likely to see a lot of new developments in the coming maybe five or ten years yeah yeah no i i certainly agree and and this might be a use case if these devices are relatively static then it might be a case where uh, like traditional phased arrays might be more uh, convenient because you if you know that the uh, device is not going to move around well uh, then you and you have a line of sight channel. Maybe it's enough to uh, to just learn the angle of arrival there and and be informed in that direction mm. and continue doing that for a very long period of time. Right, that's a good point. I mean, the, the the channel coherence might be very long, right? If the device you want to be informed is stationary, then it might be enough to learn the angle of, of arrival or angle of departure to it once and for all, almost. So there's certainly a lot of tricks and algorithmic technology that could be developed and and leveraged here yeah all right very good um so i'll I'll go to the next question and uh, um, perhaps you could have a go on that uh, emil so will analog and hybrid beamforming solutions be replaced with digital solutions in the future or is it is it is it worth it or not (laughs) to replace analog and hybrid with digital so uh, I'm definitely a big supporter of digital solutions, and I uh, I believe that in many use cases it will be uh, replacing things. But uh, then it's also easy to be too enthusiastic about uh, new prospects. And uh, I think from a sort of a, a practical or economical perspective, we should think about that, okay, what... Uh, if you compare, say, a phased array that can just beam form in a particular direction, just send one signal at a time, so that uh, is some kind of analog type of solution, then uh, what can you gain in additional uh, with massive MIMO? Well, you can serve multiple use at the same time of frequency. You can co- uh, deal with complicated propagation mm. environments. When there are maybe 10, 15 different directions that are leading to the user and you need to make sure that for every user you get the, the right combination of those ones. That's essentially what our processing are, are implicitly mm-hmm. doing. But if you are in a scenario where you don't need that feature, say that you we have a lot of base station on the 
countryside, rural areas, and they are used to beamform to one house or to one highway and follow particular directions. And there is not much variability, there is not much usage, then probably you can get away with simple solutions and they will cost less, they might consume less energy mm. and be more efficient uh, energy-wise and cost-wise. Mm. So you're saying, you're, you're suggesting there's a market for both solutions here, right? Yeah. Like a budget massive MIME would be some hybrid solution that works reasonably in, in line of sight sort of propagation. And then when you really want to get high performing, high fi massive <laughs> MIME, then you'd go for fully digital. That's uh, the, the key there. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember when we were starting to discuss the massive MIME technology with people in the industry, they were also saying that, look, we are looking at our nationwide uh, system uh, simulators and look we don't see much gains in massive mime it's only in uh, like five percent of the cells and uh, those are of course the five percent of the cells that are driving out of the traffic that are in the mm. cities uh, and there yeah. is the first use case of massive mime <laughs> but then in the countryside you might have a lot of base stations that are not limited by their capacity uh, they're only there mm. to provide coverage and and for those sorts it might take a long time before you actually benefit from a digital solution Mm. Yeah, I mean, again, what you're saying is the, I mean, one of the main selling points of massive MIMO with fully digital beam farming is that we, we multiplex many users at the same time, right? Mm. And that, of course, rests on the assumption that there are users that we want to multiplex. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and the second selling point is that you can deal with complicated propagation environments. And if you uh, have a very simple oh, yeah. one, well, then uh, you don't get that benefit either yeah right hmm. oh well uh mm -hmm. we got i think two more questions to go yes. here on the list so i have um, one for you you want to go on to the next yeah yeah so <laughs> uh, talking about beamforming so when we're applying things like zero forcing and things like that when you're trying to serve many use at the same time uh, and then you're solving a say matrix inversion and you figure out how much power and which phase you should put on different antennas, then uh, you are essentially getting different amplitudes and phase on the antennas and those amplitude variations on the antennas, uh, I believe those should sort of create more dynamic variations in the signal mm. power on each antenna, which is a problem when it comes to power amplifiers that prefers to have small variations because you uh, they can't be built to be have a linear amplification everywhere. So uh, is this a, a problem that mm. we are, with massive MIMO technology, increasing the dynamic range and we get more power amplifier mm. issues? I mean, it is a legitimate point, I think, but let's also remember that one of the main culprits here in terms of creating high peak to average rate is OFDM modulation, right? Then, of course, if you put some exotic beam forming on top of the OFDM, it could aggravate the problem. Uh, that's certainly true. And it is an issue, I mean, because, you know, in, in, in practice, you want not to high peak to average ratio. High peak to average ratio forces you to back up your power amplifiers, which in turn reduces power efficiency and so forth. And if you don't do that, you'll get out of band emissions. And as we know, out of band emissions are can be disastrous and uh, yeah, that's where you have this EIRP yeah, type of requirements yeah. and those ones as well. Uh, you know, with, with a MIMO transmitter in a static environment, the out of band emissions are, are beam formed and, and directive. In, in, in a fading, in a, an environment with high mobility, there might be some averaging effect depending on if you average, I mean, if you average over time or not. But in a static environment, these out of band emissions are, are beam formed into specific directions and they could easily. I mean, if a victim stands in the way there, then you, you destroy the link for him. So um, I think this is a legit concern. I mean, and to address this properly, we have to model the transmission carefully and accurately. I mean, you basically have to go to continuous time models to really model properly the peak to average. And um, that's, a, uh, that's a topic where... Uh, there isn't a huge amount of academic work done on it. Uh, it seems to me to be a problem which is very well recognized among those who work on implementation and standardization and so forth, but hasn't been very much mainstream in the academic Massive MIMO literature mm. um, so far. Mm. Yeah, no, so... Uh... 
I think the OFD modulation, as you're saying, is already creating a lot of uh, variations, which is something that one might not think about when only dealing with the discrete time models, because you can say, oh, I put equal power on all the subcarriers, so therefore yeah. I get equal power in the time domain. Yeah. But you don't, because when you are mm-hmm. taking your uh, yeah. inverse FFT, yeah. you're sort of creating a time varying <laughs> channel that is uh, is very quickly changing yeah i mean there's a fft and the, and then there's a pulse shape you put on top of all ah, this yeah. right and continuous time pulse shape that also so it's um yeah it's a fairly intricate matter to to model properly mm. yeah yes uh, and uh, as far as i've seen uh, you add some db's extra variability by, by doing this type of, of pre-coding methods. Uh, at the receiver, it's not the same issue because you can apply everything that you want afterwards. But the, at the transmitter side, this problem arises. And I've seen a few solutions where people are uh, trying to add some constraints on how they select their pre-coding to, mm. to deal with uh, uh, some mm. of these issues. Yeah, and I think there is further room for algorithmic development in this field. Uh, again, I mean, there isn't a huge amount of literature on it but it is a, a highly important problem in practice yeah very good i think we're approaching the end and uh, i'm gonna go on the last question perhaps you can answer so yeah. the last question here is on metrics of performance that are used in wireless comms and uh, i think the point is that classically or conventionally i mean a lot of folks like to use capacity and uh, some capacity and spectral efficiency and so forth um, and the question is uh, w- well first how does it relate to OFDM but also are there other metrics that potentially are as relevant as capacity and rate and some capacity you want to elaborate on this yes so uh, I think it, one can sort of simplify this discussion by dividing into two categories when you send uh, long blocks of data and when you send short blocks of data. So when you have a short block of data, uh, which might be what you put on one subcarrier or, or multiple subcarriers in the OFDM system, but say that it's only a few thousand uh, bits or less than that, then you're going to code it with a channel code. And uh, even if you have a state of the art channel code, there will be a probability of error that you need to live with. And mm-hmm. then that is sort of your performance metric. You pick a certain uh, modulation scheme and uh, coding scheme, and then the bit error rate or the maybe the block error rate for entire code word is what matters. Because if you fail with that one, you will have to retransmit. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think in terms of metrics, I like to think that there are three regimes essentially. Okay. Right? First, there is a Shannon capacity regime where we have very long blocks. Yeah, that's a long like block case. 10,000, 100,000 bits, such that Shannon capacity and bounds on it, like achievable rate and all this, you know, um, um, uh, yeah, how to say yeah. <laughs> numbers, are, are, are legitimate proxies of performance. And then, second, there is the finite block length regime where the, the approximations and bounds from finite block length information theory are good proxies for performance. And third, there is, and, and that might be when you're down to maybe 50 bits or something like that, right? And third, there is the regime where you have only a handful of bits, like control signaling in certain cases, mm. where the bounds and approximations from finite block length information theory just too loose. And the only thing we can really do is to measure error probability empirically. Um, so certainly, I think the question is a very good one. I mean, that um, although perhaps the bulk of the bits that will be transmitted over the air interface are part of very long code words, such that some capacity is the metric to go with, there are also, no, there is also a good deal of other types of traffic for which some capacity and Shannon capacity aren't really the right way of quantifying performance and where partly other tools are available. Yes, and uh, I've also got the impression that many of the wireless systems are built so that even if you're going to transmit a large chunk of data, so you could uh, be in the regime where you have large block lengths, uh, they are still deciding to have short block lengths uh, to keep the 
decoding latency uh, down so you can uh, uh, decode things quickly and also to have sort of the flexibility that okay uh, mm. you can transmit whenever you have a possibility and you make sure that what you have received can then be decoded and then you wait for another point mm. to get uh, sort of these best effort type of networks where you're sending some chunks of data even if you know that you're going to transmit gigabytes of data in eventually mm. yeah certainly i mean latency might be determining sometimes how long code words that you can afford to use and latency requirements thereby might force you to operate in a regime where, where you have shorter block lengths than you would nominally have if you consider your whole data stream yeah yeah it's a good point yeah and to right. talking about the uh, capacity there sort of the channel capacity is the uh, maximum number of bits per second or bits per second per hertz of bandwidth that you can transmit uh, ideally over all possible ways of transmitting that's essentially what it's saying and optimal then means that if the length of your code block goes to infinity you can achieve this one with no error probability at all so it goes to mm. zero and then yeah. related to that is uh, a rate or spectral efficiency those are often used interchangeably to say that uh, this uh, is something that we achieve with a practical scheme it's a number smaller than the capacity and mm. rate uh, can have multiple meanings. It, it often means either bits per second or bits per second on hertz. And mm. spectral efficiency always means bits per second on hertz. Mm. Yeah. yeah, very good. All right, yes. Emil, I think we are through with the questions, or are we? Um, yes, I think this yeah. is all of the questions that we received <laughs> this time on yes, the theme time, of Massive yes. MIMO. We will come back with further Q&A videos. We certainly will. And as always, feel free to send us uh, comments or questions or suggestions for topic to talk about on the podcast. And with that, thanks a lot, Emil. A great conversation. And to everyone listening, thanks a lot. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe us on YouTube. And see you next time. And right. Happy New Bye. Year. Happy New Year. Mm-hmm.